Uh, so everyone, welcome back to the second day of the Mises Seminar, Australia. I hope everyone has mentally prepared themselves for another great day of engaging conversations and entertaining intellectual enlightenment. In a sense, yesterday's goal was about establishing a solid foundation uh, for further advanced discussions. Today's goal is about continuing to build upon that. So I won't go through the entire day's proceedings, but for instance, I personally cannot wait to find out who will build those pesky roads. <laughs> and more importantly, how will those who are going to build the roads get to work? Now in all seriousness, it seems to me that uh, where you have a problem of a paradox such as that, it is an in excellent indication that you should probably check your premises. In, mind, in my mind, there is no doubt that Dr. Block certainly has the answers to help solve the riddle of the roads. So before we get today under, underway, uh, it would be good if we could all turn our phones off or silence them. And with that, yes, I'll, I'll hand over to Walter Block to kick things off. Thank you. Delighted to be here again, and I hope we have as good a day or better as yesterday. It was great yesterday, and hopefully today as well. My topic today is who will build the roads or privatizing highways. Uh, you'll remember that my motto is if it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't move, privatize it. And everything either moves or doesn't move, so you privatize everything up to and including roads or down to and including roads. Uh, roads are important because a lot of libertarians try to convert other people to libertarianism. And one of the objections that you'll hear is, well, you need the government to build the roads. I mean, you, you, private enterprise can't do that. And what I hope to do is go through the idea that private enterprise not only can do it, but did do it. The initial roads <clears throat> were private. Uh, the first roads, uh, my research goes back to the ninth century in England, and the early roads in the US <clears throat> were private. I, again, I'm not familiar with the Australian situation, but if private people could build them anywhere, they could build them anywhere else. I do have a book on privatization of roads. I didn't bring it here. I have about 12 books or 20. I keep losing track of how many books I have, but I've got a lot of them, and uh, most of them are available on Amazon. This one on roads is available on the Mises web for free, so if you're skint, as they say, uh, and you want to read that book, go get it there. Before I get into Rhodes, what I'd like to do is make the case uh, both on ethical or moral grounds and on utilitarian or economic grounds for privatizing anything and then try to apply it to Rhodes. So what's the ethical case for privatizing anything? The ethical case for privatizing anything is that if it's privatized, it's part of the market. And the market is a voluntary interaction, which I think is a lot more ethical and moral than compulsory which is the middle name of government. I mean, government compels us to pay taxes and then it gives us whatever it gives us, post office, roads, whatever. And those of us who believe, and I think everyone believes that a voluntary interaction is better than uh, compulsion. I mean, that's the difference between rape and seduction. Everyone, anyone, the, the next hundred people down the street here will, will assent to that. They, they just won't apply it as rigorously as we libertarians would. So the ethical case is very clear that if it's in the market, then it's uh, based on voluntary interaction, consenting acts between adults, and as Robert Nozick uh, famously said, capitalist acts between adults also, not just uh, consenting adults or consenting capitalist acts. What's the economic or utilitarian argument for privatizing anything? And here I rely on Henry Hazlitt. By the way, I, I offered four books of uh, recommendation for new people. Um, one was Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. The other was Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrug. And the third and fourth books were um, For a New Liberty and the Ethics of Liberty by Murray Rothbard. But those are really all libertarian and not so much Austrian. If you want to get into Austrianism, I wouldn't recommend starting with Man, Economy, and State or Human Action, but maybe read some of Murray Rothbard's shorter works like uh, What Has Government Done to Our Money or The Case for 100% Dollar or, um, uh, I don't know, um, uh, his thing on uh, economic welfare. Uh, shorter essays by Murray Rothbard would be a good way to start Austrianism. 
Okay, well, what does Hazlitt say? I got sidetracked as I was mentioning Hazlitt. What he says is that the benefits of the market is that if you do a good job, you make profits and you can expand your base of operation. If you do a bad job, you lose profits, and if you do it badly enough, you're going to go bankrupt, and you'll have to do something else because you're out of business in uh, the XYZ industry, so you have to go to the ABC industry, and maybe you'll do better there. And we have this continual weeding out process of inefficiency, which is why we have pretty good flashlight batteries and pretty good pens and pretty good ties, or at least there's no crisis about them. The reason is that the people who make these things have withstood a market test of efficiency and they're still, they're still in there kicking, uh, they're still trucking as they say. Uh, so that would be the utilitarian case. Whereas in the um, case of the government, when they mess up, they just raise taxes. I mean, the, the post office, uh, I don't know what it's like here again, but in, in Canada and in the US and places I'm more familiar with, uh, the post office is just a joke. They lose money every year, and, and uh, private companies, FedEx, can do a much better job, and, and the, the post office just keeps rolling along. I mentioned uh, that the Army Corps of Engineers and FEMA between them killed 1,900 people in the aftermath of Katrina. They're still in business. I mean, that's the horror. I mean, the 1,900 people is horrible too, but from an economic efficiency point of view, at least if they had the decency to go out of business, we could then uh, progress a little, but they're still there, and they'll always be there because no matter how badly they do, uh, they don't go automatically broke. Uh, you have to wait for a, an election, maybe, uh, uh, but an election occurs every four years, and it's very uh, widespread, uh, whereas the market is very narrowly focused on, on pens or flashlight batteries, whereas uh, you're voting, say, between Obama and Romney, nobody's voting on uh, the post office or anything like that, or on FEMA. You're voting on very different things. So the political ballot box is much less efficient than the uh, uh, dollar vote or the consumer vote. The consumers have a much better handle on producers than voters on politicians for these reasons. Okay, so that's sort of the general case for privatization. And why roads? Well, to me, the main thing is they're death traps. Some 40,000 people a year die in the U.S. on the, the nation's highways. In Canada, which has one-tenth of our population, uh, instead of 300 million, they have about 30 million. About 4,000 people every year die. Now look, when 9-11 occurred and, and the uh, people killed, uh, what was it, about 3,000 people? Now that's a tragedy, 3,000 innocent people died, but here it's 40,000 people in the U.S. that are dying every year. If this was private enterprise and they were killing 40,000 people, you know that uh, uh, Chuck Schumer, a senator, a lefty senator, would be holding hearings, you know, it's greed, it's capitalism, they, they don't have any feeling for the deaths that they're causing, and on and on. But it's, it's the government, so nobody's having any hearings about that, and yet this is preposterous. Every time a little girl gets lost in a well or lost in the woods, uh, we beat the woods and try to find her because every life is precious. Here's 40,000 people dying every year on the roads. It's just horrendous. And nobody says squat about it. Well, we libertarians can say something about this. What we can say is that if we had competing roads, the presumption would be that there would be fewer deaths because uh, the Acme road would say, come to Acme. Uh, it's true we charge a little more, but our death toll is almost uh, only this much, whereas those guys over there are killing people. They're dying like flies, so come to our road. There'd be competition, just like there's competition now between uh, different kind of computers. You know, Our computer is better than your computer. Buy our computer. Uh, you'd have the same thing with roads. And this must mean that there'd be fewer deaths because the, the places that had a lot of deaths would, uh, would lose money and, and go broke and uh, other people would take over their roads and, and run their roads better. So that's one motivation why I got into this. Uh, the second motivation is um, traffic congestion. Uh, I'm told that uh, in Sydney it's just as bad as anywhere else. In any major city, the fastest way to get around is um, by bicycle or maybe motorcycle, <clears throat> but not car. A bicycle, uh, even people who are walking can sometimes beat a car that's just sort of sitting there and creeping every uh, half mile an hour or something like that, and people walk three miles an hour. <clears throat> so 
uh, traffic congestion is just horrible. And surely we would uh, have a thing called peak load pricing, namely the I mean, they do that with hotels. The ski lodges charge more in the, in the, uh, in the winter than in the summer. Uh, uh, people charge more for dinner than lunch. Uh, uh, during Christmas, the prices go up for hotels, whatever. We, peak load pricing is, is a thing that is common throughout the economy, except on the roads because there's no pricing. And if there were private road owners, presumably they would charge more during the, the peaks, uh, the morning rush hour or the uh, late afternoon rush hour, and this would tend to flatten out the oscillations. Instead, what they do, uh, the government in, in its infinite wisdom engage in anti-peak load pricing, namely they charge less during the peaks and more at other times, for example, on the bridges and the uh, tunnels. What they'll do is they'll give you a monthly pass. And if they give you a monthly pass, you can you know, ride uh, for a certain fee, uh, for the whole month. And the people who buy these are, are not somebody who comes into the city once, uh, once a month, but somebody who's a regular commuter. And regular commuters go during the, the rush hours. So what they're doing is giving them a lower price, which exacerbates the peaks and the troughs, which is the very opposite of, of what any rational economic system would do. OK, how could we save lives? Well. Competition would save lives in various ways. One way that they could do it, right now in the US, I don't know again what it's like here. You, you guys drive on the wrong side of the road. I don't know how you do that. It, it's weird. I mean, you, you sit in the wrong side of the, the driving wheel and, oh. Uh, <laughs> in the US, the minimum speed is 40, uh, 40 miles an hour, and the maximum speed is 70 in most six-lane highways, three lanes this way and three lanes the other way. I used to have a 90cc motorcycle. Uh, I could do 40 with a tailwind <laughs> and downhill <laughs> and no passenger, but with an uphill and a passenger and a headwind, uh, you know, I'd do 35, but I was young and stupid, and I'd get on the road. And, uh, and you know that if you're driving along at 70 miles an hour, people go right by you. Because, you know, 70, uh, they don't give tickets at 70. They'll give tickets at 85. So if you're doing 70, a lot of people will do 75, and they'll just march right by you. So maybe it's the variance in speed, not the speed. You see, a lot of people say, well, the re reason for deaths has got nothing to do with government. It's due to, um, what is it, uh, speeding, drunken driving, uh, uh, driver error or inattention, you know, you go uh, Googling or something while you should be looking at the road. And uh, there are various people that have uh, different numbers of causes of death. Uh, for example, the NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Well, that was a good one. A little applause. No, no I'm kidding. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, they list like 150 different reasons for deaths on the highways, the main ones being drunken driving and speeding and uh, vehicle malfunction and things like that. <clears throat> But these are just proximate causes. Look, suppose I take a, a rifle and I shoot out there and I hit somebody and you all attack me, you capture me, and you know, I'm a murderer. And I say, tut, 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 I'm not a murderer. It was the bullet that did it. I'm innocent. Well, you wouldn't swallow that for a second. I would be guilty of murder because I pulled the trigger. Yes, the bullet was the proximate cause, but the ultimate cause is me. So the, um, the proximate cause might be speeding. But the ultimate cause is the owners of the road, the managers of the road, don't deal with speeding. That would be uh, the, the difficulty with that. <clears throat> so what I'm saying is maybe it's not speeding. Maybe it's the variation in speeding. I don't know. I'm no uh, highway expert. I'm no uh, engineer of highways or anything like that. But I do know, as an economist, that if you had different roads and they had slightly different rules of the road, now you can't have two different rules of the road. You can't have some ro roads where you drive on the left side and others on the right side. Sweden went from left to right, but it took them a year to do it. So they had to notify people getting ready. So you, you can't have very, very different rules of the road, but you can have slightly different rules of the road. Now maybe what you should have is not um, a maximum speed of 70 and a minimum speed of uh, 40. Maybe what you should have is on the left lane, everyone has to do 85. 
And in the middle lane, everyone has to do 65, and in the right-hand lane, everyone has to do 45, or maybe 50, 65, and 80, or something like that. And, and you try tweaking different ways of doing it and see how you can minimize deaths. Maybe. I don't know, but it's possible. It's plausible. Another thing is if you're on a, a road, um, a three-lane highway, and the minimum speed is uh, 40 and the maximum speed is 70, and you get some jerk, I use the word advisedly, who does 50 miles an hour in the left-hand left lane, and everyone has to sort of skirt around and go around and try to get past this idiot. Well, maybe that causes accidents. Now, there are rules that they say stay to the right. In our case, in your case, if you stay to the left if you're going slowly. But they don't give tickets for that. Maybe they should give tickets for that. <clears throat> Another one is, you know, uh, if there's two lanes going this way and two lanes going that way, you know, uh, it takes 15 miles for one truck to pass another truck. You know, because they're going about the same speed, only uh, one millionth of a mile faster. So it takes a long time to get past the, uh, uh, a truck that's passing another truck. And if you see two trucks lining up, I don't know about you, but what I do is I try to scoot ahead of them so I don't have to wait 15 miles to get ahead of the truck. Well, maybe you should have a rule that the, the truck on the right uh, has to go a little slower so it doesn't take 15 minutes to pass. That would be another way to have safety. Another way might be um, uh, put a cross or a Jewish star or uh, whatever the Islamic people use to indicate uh, their religion near every fatality. Big ones. I'm not talking about ones this size. I'm talking about 30 feet tall to indicate that, you know, here is a dangerous place and maybe everyone should be a little more careful. So in my book, I go through maybe 15 or 20 different things that possibly could work to reduce deaths. But I, I, I don't uh, swear by any of them. What I do swear by is the process, that if people are competing to reduce deaths and they try different things, uh, I mean, right now we, we have one set of rules uh, emanating from Washington, D.C. There's no experimenting. It's, it's just, imagine if the computer company or the computer industry was like that, where uh, Washington, D.C. would say, well, this is how computers have to be. You can't have these touch things or surface or whatever it is. You all have to do whatever we say in Washington. That would be a recipe for stultification of the industry. Well, that's what we have in highways. Okay. Um, I got into a little tangle with Larry White. Uh, he and I tangled on fractional reserve banking, but here we tangled on a different issue. Uh, I, I estimated in my book that if we had private roads, instead of 40,000 people a year dying, we'd have something like 5,000 a year dying. Because even private, and the way I did is I extrapolated from how much more efficient private is than public in other areas, such as sanitation removal. Look, when you're desperate for data, you, <laughs> you grab whatever you can. So I extrapolated from how much more efficient is the private than the government in many, many other areas. And I came up with five to one or eight to one. So I said, well, we'll reduce the deaths by uh, a ratio of five to one or eight to one or something like that. And uh, what Larry White said is, well, if this is true, suppose that private enterprise would kill 5,000 people a year and government kills 40. Well, then Larry said, Block is wrong. Uh, the government isn't really responsible for 40,000 deaths. They're only responsible for 35,000 deaths. <laughs> and look, if you're going to be an apologetic for the state, that's a good way to go. <laughs> and my response was the following. Let's stipulate that Hitler killed uh, six million Jews. But it took him four years to do it, and let's suppose that 100,000 Jews would have died in those four years of natural causes. So is Hitler guilty of killing six million or 5.9 million? Six million, doggone it. <laughs> he killed six million even though 100,000 would have died from natural causes. He's responsible for that. So I claim that the government is responsible for all the deaths, not just the... Um, uh, the difference between how many deaths there would be in the one case and how many deaths there'd be in the other case. The, uh, the reaction to this, uh, uh, then what I do uh, in the first half of the book, uh, or in part of the book, I, I give the case that I just gave you. And then what I do is I deal with a whole bunch of objections. And uh, there are many, many objections that I try to anticipate and, and refute. For example, one objection is, well, if you had a private highway 
the way it would be, or a private street, uh, every uh, house owner would own uh, half the road. Okay, uh, picture a, a street or an avenue and you've got houses on both sides. And every time you pass some house, which takes 100 feet to pass, you have to put a penny in their uh, meter. And this would drive traffic even slower than it is now. In order to refute this, when I first started writing about it, it was in the 70s, and I started reading grocery journals and pharmaceutical journals, and people said, what are you reading grocery journals? And it's because at that time, I think it was in the late 60s, uh, the uh, universal product codes were first coming in. Nowadays, you go to the supermarket and they take your can of tuna fish and they go blip, and then it adds up on the, on the register. Well, this is before. This is just at the beginning of that. And what I said is we could do the same thing with cars. You put some sort of universal product code on the underbody of a car, and then as you go past the road, uh, you uh, trigger some sort of electronic uh, whatever, and uh, you get a bill at the end of the month. So you, you wouldn't have to put a, a penny in or one-tenth of a penny in every time you pass somebody's house. Uh, so that, that objection would be wrong. Uh, another uh, objection to um, uh, private roads is you would need eminent domain or um, uh, expropriation, what they call in Canada. Namely, the government would have to seize land. Suppose I want to build that road I was mentioning the other day from Sydney to Perth, and there might be 100,000 different property owners in between the two, <clears throat> and you might get a holdout. Well, this is a, a, a question I did discuss the other day, so I'm not going to uh, uh, spend much time on it, but I will uh, complicate it, uh, matters a little bit. Uh, suppose that there was a holdout. <coughs> you have a holdout, and he, um, he anticipates the fact that you might build under him or bridge over him. What happened was uh, I, my son and I I was, my son was 15 at the time when I was starting to do that. He's about 35, so it was 20 years ago. And he uh, got on my case, this is wrong, and we were arguing about this. And uh, finally, I wrote the thing up, and it was based on our conversations. And I had a choice of, well, could I thank him, make him the co-author, even though he didn't write one word, but it came out of our dialogue, and I decided to make him a co-author because it was really a product of the, the thinking of the two of us. And what my son mentioned was, well, suppose you're the holdout, and you know that somebody's going to build a, a, a tunnel under you or a bridge over you, you're going to start homesteading the area first. You'll put big sticks down in, into the earth to preclude him from getting under you, or you'll put the umbrellas up on top to make sure he can't get over you. And the way we finally solved this one is, I don't, uh, you have rugby and, and soccer here, we have American football. Uh, the way the football analogy goes is, you know, it's easier to, uh, to move the ball when you're in midfield because then you have half the field to operate on. But when you get close to the goal, point, the, the goal, uh, the goal line stand, it's harder because you have less room to operate in. That would be the analogy. So what we have is an offense and a defense. The offense is the guy who uh, wants to build the, uh, the tunnel under or the bridge over. The defense is the property owner who is the holdout who is putting sticks here and there. And the point that we came up with is that the offense has a natural advantage because how much land does the offense need? Well, if you're going to have a, a six-lane highway, each lane is maybe 15 feet wide, and then you have a... a some grass in the middle. Maybe it's 150 feet wide to, to put the road. So your football is only 150 feet wide. Whereas the defense has got to defend miles and miles of sticks. So if he puts sticks uh, at 40 feet, he's got to do it for 10 miles. Whereas all you need is 150 feet. Does everyone understand what I'm saying here? Uh, in other words, uh, the offense, the uh, road owner has an advantage over the defense. So this objection to building under or tu uh, tunneling under or building over uh, doesn't make any sense. Uh, there are some other objections uh, that I dealt with. Um, but what I'd like to do, 
as I said, I, I want to do, uh, have a, a lot more time for questions and dialogue and discussion, and, and not, you know, I don't want to fill up the whole hour. I've written the book. It's available for free. Go get it. Uh, by the way, I've still got some other books here that I'm trying to sell, so buy them if, if you're interested in them. So what I'd like to do is um, uh, call for discussion, questions, and um, uh, yes, sir. All right, am I coming through? Um, suppose we all agree that we should privatize the roads, and it's a good idea, and we're ready to do it now. How might we go about it? Okay, that's another objection, uh, namely the transition period. How do you do it? Uh, we have roads uh, already, and we have streets, and, and um, you know, who gets to own what? Well, it's a similar thing that I was discussing, well, how do we get to own the Mississippi River or the various oceans? If we had a God's eye view with regard to roads, what we would do, God's eye, the idea is God knows everything. I'm an atheist, but I'm employing this as a technique. Uh, God knows exactly which taxes from which people went into which roads. And uh, let's suppose that there's some highway and, and we can now ascertain whose money went into the building of the road. And what we do is we make a stock company. And we give shares in this stock company in proportion to the amount of money that you put into the road. So uh, if there are a million shares and you uh, put in uh, 10,000 of taxes, well, then you get 10,000 over 1 million share of the roads. And now we have a corporation, and, and the corporation runs the road, and it's owned by all the people whose money went into it. Uh, th remember, this is the same problem that the Soviets faced uh, when they wanted to privatize. This is the same problem that the British Columbia of Canada faced when it wanted to privatize its um, nationalized industry. There is, uh, without a God's eye view, you're not going to do it perfectly. But better to do it <clears throat> ineptly than not to do it at all. Uh, the key is to get it into the market, and it's not so important how you do it. It could be arbitrary. Give every uh, person on the side of the road uh, one over n share of the road, or uh, maybe the truckers who use the road, or the people who can prove that they uh, use the passengers who commuted on the road, uh, they get to own the road in, in proportion. Uh, so this would be a way of doing it. As for new roads, you, you would the way you would build a new road is you just buy up property and, and uh, contiguous property, and if there's a holdout, well, we've dealt with the holdout problem. So the answer to how do we do the transition period is ineptly, because it's not really part of the market. It would have to be done by the government or the authorities or somebody. But the key is not so much to worry about how, to, how do you do it, it's to get it in the private hands. And once it's in private hands, then, well, we're not home free, but we're a long way uh, towards solving all the problems. And I think the, the, mo uh, the model or the principle would be uh, he who gets uh, ownership in proportion to how much money they spent or how much they homesteaded it. Somebody asked me, uh, while I'm speaking of homesteading, uh, people ask me very good questions in the breaks, and a person said, um, how do you homestead something that you want to keep pristine, right? Uh, like there are certain areas of, of uh, Wood, wooded lands or something that you, you want to keep it pristine and therefore it's a little difficult to have homesteading because homesteading by its very nature means you have to change it. Murray Rothbard addressed this by saying, well, maybe you put in bathrooms or you put in rails to keep it safe, but the purists don't want that. I don't know where they'll go to the bathroom, but that's, that's another problem. Um, the answer I gave was, you don't have to homestead it with your own physical hands. You can homestead it uh, through intermediaries, namely cattle ranchers don't homestead the land directly, they homestead it through cattle. Uh, I co-authored an article with my friend Michael Edelstein and what we said is, well, if you can do it with cattle, why can't you do it with butterflies or worms? So what you do is you capture a few butterflies, you capture a few worms, you pat them over here so you show that you own them, and then you let them out, you throw them over toward the places where you want to homestead, and they homestead it for you. And now you own pristine land that you never touched and, and hasn't been ruined in any way. So that would be my homesteading answer. Yes? Hi, it's Ryan here. I've got a quick question. So now that we own all the roads, how does each road, it, it seems to me each road has a different target market, and how does a road, each, I say there's two roads, they've got different destinations. What, 
why would they differentiate? What's their incentive to create the road to be safer or faster, um, to attract <laughs> customers if each road goes to a different sub-market? It, it seems to me that perhaps the only way would be to have multiple layers of roads above or below going in the same direction, is that? That would be one way. You would have uh, in New York City on the, uh, not the West Side Highway, the Riverside Drive, there is uh, one road going this way and another road going right above it. So you could have it that way. Uh, there was a, uh, a book, I forget the name of the book, uh, one of the muckraking books, I think it was The Octopus, but I'm not sure. And what it was, was there was a railroad in California that went up and down California and uh, they were screwing over the, the customers. They would announce, well, here's the price for uh, a ton of lima beans uh, per mile. And then when the lima beans came in, they just jacked up the price and they were just acting a very bad way according to the novelist. What, what did that railroad fear the most? The competition. What it feared is another railroad going north and south, 10 miles or 15 miles east or west or whatever it was, because what would happen to the present discounted value of the first road if the second road was even thinking of being built? It would, it would plummet. But they didn't have to fear because in order to build another railroad, you had to get the permission of the politicians and, and these railroad people were, well, you know, the, you can't buy a politician, you know, only rent one. So they were renting politicians so that they didn't have that fear. But in, in a free market situation, the last thing that a road owner wants to do is to act capriciously. Because then someone will say, hey, you know, these guys are a bunch of jerks. They're screwing us over. Let's build another road parallel to them uh, five miles away or uh, uh, 50 yards away or whatever it is or above them or below them. That's the last thing they would want. So th there is such a thing called potential competition, which is why the, the mainstream view on, um, what do you call it, um, antitrust is all wrong. Because what they do is they have a four-firm concentration ratio or an eight-firm concentration ratio or a Herfindahl index, for those of you who are into economics, which sort of is an indication of how concentrated the industry is. Well, first of all, it's very hard to define an industry. What is the industry? Is it roads or is it uh, helicopters or, you know, you have substitutes? And then there's the thing about potential competition. You know, uh, if you have the railroad and there's no other railroad, and let's say there's nobody else competing, there are no highways or something, still you don't want potential competition. So there would be competition. Would it be as good as uh, computers or shoes? No. Because it's harder to compete, it's harder to even have potential roads, but there'd be some market um, uh, uh, control that would induce people to act in a reasonable way. Another objection, uh, well, I, I forget, is uh, the objection is that the road owner will um, uh, box you in. In other words, you, uh, you, you put your house in there and then you want to go out on the road and the guy says, oh, that'll be a million dollars every time you come on my road. Uh, right now, we have a thing called title insurance. Before you buy a, um, a piece of land or a house, you get title insurance, namely the, the guy who's selling it to you is really the owner, and if not, the insurance company will indemnify you. Well, we would now have access insurance, or we would have contracts. Uh, namely, before you bought a house, you would find out, well, what's the deal? Can I get out on the road or not? Or do I need a helicopter? Or do I have to become a pole vaulter and you know, sort of jump over the road or something like that? So the, these objections, I think, can be easily dealt with. That's just another one that I, I thought of off, uh, offhand. But you see, every road owner wants people to settle next contiguous to him. I mean, if you just build a road and nobody rides on it, you're not going to make money. So what you want to do is induce people. And one way to induce them is to contractually obligate yourself to say, well, look, I'm never going to charge you more than I charge anyone else or something like that. Uh, and then there's another objection, uh, privacy. You know, you, uh, you're Petraeus, you want to go visit your girlfriend, and uh, <laughs> you don't want to have any record of uh, you visiting. Well, we have various ways of keeping things private uh, through Amazon.com and other ways, and, and roads could adopt that as well. Yes? OK, um, one objection that springs to mind, certainly if I've uh, you know, suggested privatizing anything and everything, uh, the objection that always comes up with roads is, well, what about rural areas, particularly in somewhere like Australia, where uh, the population is sparse in areas? Uh, what would those people do? Would they just be out of luck? Or how, how would you deal with that objection? OK, that's a good objection. What do you do about the rural people? Uh, what they do with the post office is they charge the same price no matter where you are. 
and you can be in the wilds of Alaska and it costs an arm and a leg to get you your mail, but they charge the same price. Well, obviously, uh, in the private sector, you, you want to go get some orange juice in Alaska and it's, it's going to cost triple because it takes a lot of money to get orange juice to Alaska or to the interior of Australia, which I assume is the economic equivalent of, uh, of Alaska. Uh, and the marginal revenue product of labor in these uh, outlying areas has to be much higher to afford to bring in the stuff. So yes, uh, the road uses would, uh, usage would be higher in rural areas, but your productivity would be higher, otherwise you wouldn't be there, other things equal. Um, but how, how, did the, how does the present thing do it? Uh, the present thing, the way it's done is, uh, in Alaska, there's this thing called the, the road to nowhere, they, or a bridge to nowhere. They built a bridge for millions of dollars, and there were like five people that could use it. And the reason they did it is because the senator from Alaska lived near there. So that's the way the political sphere uh, answers this question. You know, it's based on political poll. The way the market would answer it is, yes, it'll cost more because the cost of getting any service to you in Alaska or in the middle of Australia is much more expensive because there's nobody there. And, uh, you know, to serve three people is very, very expensive, whereas to serve three million people in a city is a lot cheaper. So, yeah, uh, you have to pay for the cost. It's the same thing like if you're... Uh, if you're eight foot tall, uh, you have to pay more for clothing because you can't get off the rack because there are so few people who are eight feet foot tall. Uh, yeah, so if it costs more to serve you, you gotta pay more. Well, that's the market for you, and you know, if you don't like it, get out of the market, or <laughs> I don't know, but that, that's the way the market works for everything. If, if it costs more to serve you, whether it be because you're eight foot tall or you're located out in the, the boonies somewhere, well, then you pay more. Uh, Professor Block, um, I, in your description of the problem of... I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Okay, in your description of the problem of traffic and government controlling the roads, many of your points were dead right. For instance, passing is very dangerous. David Navon in Israel has written on this. Can um, you speak a little louder? I'm certainly. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, there's been a number of uh, articles that have dealt with these things. Traffic engineers have talked about this for a long time. Um, the central point, I think, is that your suggestions for managing traffic, we have a lot of this stuff already. The government already has electronic toll. We already have tidal management of traffic where the lanes are opened up one way going into the city and then in the afternoon going out again. We have all these things. And the pricing mechanism is there as well. The government already does these things. What it generally does is play with people's behavior, tax them, find them if they don't obey the rules. I, find, I would find it unusual if you had missed Peltzman's classic paper in 1975 about driving behavior, where he discussed what he called driving intensity. It's really people's driving behavior, and that is what the government deals with very poorly, uh, whereas your solutions, I think, are more based on the physical road. Uh, no, I... I uh I hear you, and I agree that the government is doing some of these things, like you now can get through uh, tunnels and bridges without stopping the pay because they do it electronically. It's just that the market would have done it 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when they did it with groceries, and now it took a much longer time for the government to do it because of this uh, non-weeding out process in the government. And you're quite right. Uh, uh, you know, there's this group, I don't know if it's here, but in the U.S. it's called MADD, M -A -D -D, Mothers Against Drunken Driving. You must have something like that. You see, the, the benefit of uh, net, uh, nature conservancy, uh, environmental groups, and Ducks Unlimited, is they can buy land and they can run the land the way they think is best. MAD can't buy a highway and run it the way they would like it because there are no private roads. Now imagine a MAD road uh, and they caught a drunken driver. They string them up by uh, certain body parts that, that hurt. Uh, you can be very draconian. You can say, look, if you get caught drunken driving or drug driving, if we legalize drugs, uh, we're going to take your car or we're going to execute you or whatever it is. It's a private road. They can make whatever rules they want, uh, assuming that uh, they're not contractually obligated not to do that. Uh, 
what I'm saying is that not only would a private owner be able to do physicality, as you mentioned, but also would be able to do behavior modification. Uh, another point that I have in the book is, uh, you know chicken races? where two cars go together and they each stay on the same line and if, if one of them doesn't veer off, they'll get into a, a crash. Well, you might have chicken races on, on private roads, which would get rid of, a, you know, weeding, a, what is it called, a, weeding the herd or something like that, getting rid of maniacs. <laughs> let, them, let them crash against each other you, from two to four in the morning. You, you know, you could open up one side of the road for normal traffic and the other side of the road, you could have chicken races, you could sell tickets uh, and watch them crash, uh, crash against each other, which would be a way of eliminating uh, people who shouldn't be out on the roads in the first place because they're, they're nuts and they, they, cause, they cause damages. So not only would uh, road owners be in competition with each other for physical things, but they would also be in competition with each other for how do you deal with drunken drivers or how do you deal with speeders? Or maybe how do you deal with people who hog the left lane or the, the fast lane and go slowly? whatever it is. So th this idea of competition pervades everything, not just uh, a, a limited amount of things. Um, Professor, can I uh, suggest that your approach is based on two presumptions which uh, could be questioned. One is that there is always an alternative, and second, that people are always rational. Um, what do you do with something that's unique when it's owned by somebody somebody who's irrational. And let me just give you an example. What if somebody purchases Niagara Falls? What if somebody what's to Niagara Falls? Buys Niagara oh, Falls. Yeah, buys Niagara Falls, yes. Now he owns Niagara Falls and uh, this person is irrational and decides he'd rather have a car park there. So he decides he wants to concrete it over and build a car park. Um, how do you deal with that? Well, I, you know, uh, an economist was once asked, how do you, uh, how's your wife? And his answer was, compared to what? <laughs> I mean, it's always a comparison. Uh, is there no irrationality in, in the government sector? Yes, there's irrationality there too. They build bridges to nowhere. They, do, they, they kill 40,000 people a year. They do irrational things too. Uh, would there be irrationality on the part of the private sector? Yes. There would be nuts who would uh, take the Grand Canyon and fill it up or wh whatever the equivalent is uh, in other countries. But the point is that there'd be fewer of them because in order to do that, you have to have a lot of money to own the Grand Canyon or the Niagara Falls or something like that. And probably no one person with the exception of Bill Gates or someone like that would be able to own any big thing like that. So you'd have to have millions of people owning a stock company and if the president said, well, we've got to fill in the Grand Canyon or we've got to uh, uh, put a car park in Niagara Falls, the, they would boot him out. Whereas if a politician did it, it would be harder to boot him out. Not impossible, but harder. So it's a, it's a, a comparison. Here you have the public sector, here you have the private sector. Will there be irrationality in the private sector? Yes. But when you do something irrational like that, you lose money and you have less of a chance to keep doing bad things. Whereas in, in the government sector, if you do bad things, you can keep going on forever. Uh, the second point you make, and both of these are very good objections, uh, th is there always an alternative? Well, not always. Uh, there could be exceptions. Uh, uh, but if you, if you can build a road over another road or under another road, it might be more expensive, then there's always a potential alternative. You don't need an actual alternative. Potential competition is a very powerful tool in making the economy work more efficiently. So even though the potential alternative is more expensive, that gives a, a sort of a, an area with, in which the first guy can be irrational. But if he gets too irrational, then the alternative kicks in. I don't know, what, I don't know whether you know of it, but there's, there's a town in Holland, I think its population is about 50,000. They have no um, traffic lights or stop signs. I believe they have speed humps and roundabouts. Um, but apart from that, there are no rules. And the average speed of traffic in that town is the same as in towns that are normal with traffic lights. So <clears throat> here you, you, could, you could say that um, the, the government interference in the, in the flow of traffic is a great deal less 
Um, therefore, we should get rid of all traffic lights and, and stop signs and replace them with speed humps and, and roundabouts. Uh, that, that's a very good point, and I think it fits in with my hypothesis or my thesis that the market can do a better job. Uh, again, I'm no expert on traffic. I don't know if this is true, and I don't know. Maybe this can only work in some small population areas. I don't know. But what I would say is that if you had private owners, some of them on their roads would take down the traffic lights, take down the stop signs, and see. And if it was better, then they would do it more. Uh, so th this uh, doesn't really vitiate against my theory. It's rather part and parcel of the, the, the libertarian theory of, of highways. Namely, different owners would be able to experiment with different ways of controlling traffic, and then we'd see. Look, the rules of the road don't come from God on uh, engraven tablets. That they shouldn't come from Washington, D.C., or what's the capital of Australia? Can Canberra. Canberra, it shouldn't come from there, it should come from the market. Uh, the, the, the government doesn't say how shoes should be made, and, and shoes are, there's no shoe crisis. Well, the government shouldn't say how road, rules of the road are. This should also come from the market, and the market uh, entrepreneurs would have an incentive to get traffic to flow better and, and more safely. Um, just that while you were speaking, a few things came to mind, a few words. Uh, a few, uh, regarding existing private solutions, and that's things like in a long time ago, city-states. Uh, today, more re recently, there's gated, gated communities, uh, malls, retirement homes. These are all facilities which are privately operated, and they have networks within them which are involved in transport, which are private solutions. So they give me thought, give me to think, um, over the, t like, if we think about gov uh, roads currently, d do they have existing competition against them? So, uh, t for example, um, in, in your own field, and as an academic, in the old days, which was last year, there would um, be students attending your classes. Now I understand the students would not bother actually traveling to your class, but they would come to you over the internet. So these are private solutions which are evolving um, in competition to the roads, and if you think in terms of the absolute extreme with total congestion, which the roads the government operate are can't be used, the private market is actually today coming up with solutions to get around that. Well, I think that's a good point that uh, we were talking about all their alternatives. Well, one way of uh, one alternative way of having a business meeting is doing it by Skype. You don't have to either get on an airplane or on a road uh, to meet five other people and you can all Skype each other. So uh, the electronic is a substitute for transportation. So that, that's a very good point. Uh, th this new thing about teaching, uh, it's MOOC. I forget what it stands for, but the idea you get a Harvard professor who, instead of lecturing to 300 kids, lectures to 300,000 people through electronics. This might uh, outcompete private universities. I'm not sure because I think private universities also have a sorting mechanism. Uh, girls get their MRS, you know, um, by going to a good school where people sort themselves out, and that's a function that couldn't be done electronically. So I don't know if, if, if it will work or not. It's up to the market to decide that. But you make a very good point about substitutes for transportation, namely electronic ways of communicating uh, by email. I mean, uh, I can email all of you people in, in one, you know, press of a button if I had all your email addresses, and we wouldn't have to get together here, but people flew me in here because somehow it's not a perfect substitute. I mean, you guys could have listened to me on Google. I have a lot of Google lectures where I talk about the things that I talk about here, but the idea is you, know, you get up close and personal, and, and it's not a perfect substitute, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Right? You listen to me on a screen or something like that, but it's not the same thing because the proof of it is that I'm here. So it's, it's not a perfect substitute, but it is a, a substitute, it is an alternative. One last question. I will um, <clears throat> completely agree with you about this road issue, but I think there's something that, that deserves a mention which I haven't heard you talk about, and that's the fear and uncertainty under a privatized system. So uh, the reason the, um, the abolishing of road rules and traffic lights work is because people feel less safe and so they drive more carefully. Um, and the same thing was tried in, in Bristol or in Brighton as well, just on one intersection and the same result. 
in Detroit, they had a bunch of traffic lights go out at rush hour, and all of a sudden all the traffic congestion cleared up and nobody had a crash, so it does work. But under that system, you're, the reason it's working is because you feel less safe, and I think people want to feel safe and they want to have certainty, so um, th there is this kind of issue that, that doesn't seem to get mentioned a lot by free market uh, individuals. Well, to me, this is the, uh, very similar to the question of, uh, it's really a marketing question. Should the restaurant have uh, blue tablecloths or pink ones or striped ones? Th th there's no uh, apodictic certainty f emanating from Austrian economics as to whether we should have traffic lights or not or, or what color the tablecloth should be in the restaurant. It's uh, totally an empirical thing and different people try different things and then we see, well, maybe pink tablecloths uh, attract more uh, uh, customers than blue tablecloths or whatever the, the example is. So I'm not saying that yes, we should have or we shouldn't have stop signs and roundabouts or uh, traffic lights. I'm saying let the market decide. Thank you very much.